I really appreciate the opportunity to address you tonight. And uh, I will say that the paper that Dr. David was referring to was published. It's published in uh, Microscopy Today. Uh, this is a journal that is published by Cambridge University Press. And you're going to see some of this work tonight. Uh, we also have brand new work that we just submitted to the journal that is in consideration for publication. So uh, we're really excited about that. And so you're going to see all the new work tonight. Um, I do want to tell you a little bit about the Dinosaur Soft Tissue Research Institute. Um, we have a mission which is really clear. Uh, we want to locate and characterize uh, as much dinosaur soft tissue from as many different taxa, that's different organisms, uh, preferably all reptiles, dinosaurs, but other reptiles, uh, and depositional environments because we're finding that the depositional environments uh, uh, have a little bit to do with some of the preservation of the things that you're going to see tonight. Our goal is to publish every finding and publish them in secular journals. Uh, we're a science organization. Uh, we're all volunteers. Um, none of us is paid. In fact, we end up spending our own money <laughs> mostly to do this work. Uh, but I think that insulates us a little bit uh, from charges that, uh, you know, we might otherwise not be a scientific organization, but that's what we are. Uh, we, we do the work and we publish and we're, we're uh, making a lot of world first discoveries, which is really pretty exciting. And again, you're going to see that tonight. Uh, all of our results uh, are given away, uh, mostly in the form of reprints. And uh, we do have a website, distry.org. That stands for the Dinosaur Soft Tissue Research Institute.org. If you go there, you can find our reprints. You can download them. So the actual papers that we publish uh, are available uh, on the website. Uh, also, selected videos can be streamed. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel separately. And if you go to YouTube and you search in their little search bar, uh, Mark H. Armitage, A-R-M-I-T-A-G-E, uh, you will see all the videos of, that go back to the Triceratops horn. Uh, how many of you have heard of the 48-inch long Triceratops horn that we found? Okay, a few of you. Uh, so some of the work tonight is related to that horn, but most of it is on uh, specimens that we've collected since then. Uh, but that was the first paper that was published. We went, we went to Montana in 2012. Um, we discovered the horn. We'd been digging for a whole week, well, actually about four days. And uh, it was the last day. We had to head back to Los Angeles, and we hadn't found any long bones. We were looking for long bones. Why? You're going to hear about long bones tonight. Because those are the bones that most uh, paleontologists go to to look for dinosaur soft tissue. Why? Well, they're highly encapsulated. You've got this very thick, compact bone around the outside, and the horn was like this. You can see it on the table here. And we're going to talk about these specimens, and, and you're welcome to come up and handle these. The only one I don't want you to handle is the big one on the end. But if you look at that big base of the Triceratops horn, which is at the end of the table, you'll see this massive amount of compact bone around the outside and all the vasculature, all the blood vessels and veins are in the center. And so they were going after long bones because that hard, thick, compact bone around the center kept all the center protected. So that's what we were looking for. And we dug for four days. We didn't find anything. And so on the last day, we happened upon this horn. It took us eight hours to get it out of the ground. But all those videos are up on distry.org. You can watch all that. It goes all the way back to the beginning in 2012. Uh, you can also see updates on our talks and discoveries. Uh, you can download free books. All of our books are free. We print uh, as many of them as we can afford and give them away. Tonight, I'll tell you about the books that we have up front that are here for you. And uh, we want you to take those. And we want you to share those with people. Old Stretchy 1 and Old Stretchy 2. Uh, these books are not to sit on a shelf, folks, okay? They're not to sit on your desk. Uh, that's why we want you to download them and give them away. If, 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 uh, if we can print more, we certainly will, but we made it available for folks to be able to give it away very easily. All of our talks are free. We don't charge to come. We don't charge for anything. Everything we do is free. 
If you Google the full name, Dinosaur Soft Tissue Research Institute, just Google that, our Facebook page will also come up, and you can like us and friend us on, on Facebook, which would be great. Uh, we are a 501c3 organization, so uh, we welcome any support that uh, you might be willing to give, including prayer support. That's really important for us. Um, now this talk, The Soft Side of a Mean Dinosaur, uh, this one is already on video. It's about Nanotyrannus. Has anybody heard of Nanotyrannus? Anybody heard of that? Okay, a few of you have. And so uh, that, that, that set of videos is the lecture that we did last year down at Lower Columbia College. And so that's all up on Distri. You can watch those. I'm not going to rehash that tonight. That's your homework. Okay? So you're going to go home and you're going to do your homework on Nanotyrannus. Tonight I want to show the latest work. And I'm just going to do this as a scientific report. I think that's important, particularly because we're recording it, and this uh, should go out as a scientific report. Uh, after the presentation, which should last for about 50 minutes, we'll take a quick break, maybe one, two minutes tops. Uh, you can run to the restroom if you need to. You can come up and look at the bones. And uh, you can come up and gather uh, books. Uh, there's two you can take from, one per family from each of the books. And then we'll do Q&A, because that's usually where things get lively, is doing the Q&A. So we'll save plenty of time, and we'll take as much time as we need to for questions and answers. Uh, does that sound okay to everybody? All right, let's get started here. Bone is amazing because when you dig it out of the ground, nine times out of ten, it's not fossilized. It's still bone, which means it's soft tissue. Bone is really, even though it's mineralized, it's a soft tissue, and it's full of soft tissue. And really, it's a treasure trove of uh, tissue elements that are encapsulated inside the bone. I'm not going to take a lot of time to talk about long bones or how they're built. Uh, this is on the previous presentations, which you can watch online. But the one thing that I want to point out to you are well, two things. The first thing is that in these canals, this is called a canal, a Haversian canal. It's named after a, a person named... Uh, well, I don't even know his name, actually, to be honest with you. But it's called a Hadversian canal, and in these canals are traveling the blood vessel, which is painted red, the, the vein, which is painted blue, you can see it here a little bit, and then this yellow structure. You see that yellow structure? That's a nerve, folks. So these are called neurovascular bundles, and they travel in that triad together inside your bones. So right now you have all these tissue elements inside your bones. And look at these little dots here. You see all those little dots and there's a bunch of them along here and they seem to run, they like to run in circles. They make these circular, they're called lamellae. Uh, those little dots are cells. They're called osteocytes and they're a marvel of engineering. Osteocytes are actually measuring in real time the compression of your bones as you're climbing stairs, going on a hike, picking up a heavy object. These little cells, because they have these tiny little thread feet, these are very tiny, these are about 200 nanometers thin. Um, maybe I'll show you a scale in a while and you can see how that scale <clears throat> matches up. But these little thread feet actually reach out through the bone. These guys encase themselves in bone and they reach out with these little thread feet and they touch each other. So all these cells are touching each other in three axes, actually multiple axes in the bone. And that's how they work together to measure that compression as you're moving around and carrying things. So these are amazing. We're not going to talk a lot about osteocytes tonight, but the previous presentation from last year is really important uh, because it shows how these tissues, particularly the osteocytes, respond to tissue stains in the laboratory. Now that's an astounding fact. And, and it's not publicized a whole lot. And you're going to see a picture of uh, one of these structures tonight that's stained with a, uh, uh, a nuclear, uh, an RNA stain, actually. You've got DNA, you've got uh, uh, RNA as nuclear material in the nucleolus. And we've actually stained it with an RNA stain. So they take up these stains, which are used routinely in the laboratory all the time, and they behave as normal tissues do even though they've been in the ground for question mark number of years, right? We'll put it that way. 
So that's what I want you to focus on tonight, is this triad of vessels, veins, and nerves called the neurovascular bundle. That's going to become apparent to you as we go through. So not only do we find blood vessels, which are very common in uh, these preparations, and you might ask yourself, well, how are you getting these things out of the bone? Well, there's a process called decalcification where you soak the bone or pieces of the bone in a weak acid and it just deconstructs the bone. It kind of falls apart in solution. And all these veins are laying on the bottom of a slide after the decalcification process. So you have to imagine all of these veins being in a vertical 3D conformation and they've just fallen out after decalcification. Does that make sense? So these are all delicate, tiny veins. And what's really crazy is that we're finding structures inside the veins. Uh, this was published um, this year uh, in September. And that's this issue that I showed you before. Um, we also find the valves that are in the veins, which is, in life, it's really difficult. It's really hard to get a vein valve out of a vein. But here they fall out readily. And you can see one right here. It's this circular little valve that sits inside of the vein. Remember, as the blood pumps, it's pushing blood through the arteries, right? And the arteries is going, uh, the arteries are putting the blood into all your tissues. They have to be fed, oxygenated, all that, right? And then there's waste. And so all that waste gets gathered up and gets shuttled to different organs. But all that blood goes back to the heart through the veins, right? But there's not as much pressure in the veins. Every heartbeat only pushes the blood a little bit in the veins, right? And so there are valves in there that open and close. They're actually bicuspids that, that open and close to hold the blood in place as each heartbeat pushes it up, right? These are really hard to get out of living tissue, but here they've fallen out, and you can actually see the cuspid. This cuspid is only one micron thin, and you might say, well, I don't know what a micron is. Well, one of your hairs is 100 microns wide. So this is one one hundredth the diameter of one of your hairs thick. It's a one micron sl slice of cuspid tissue that is still there. Still there. This is so delicate. And so you can see it beautifully in this picture. But over here, we've got two vein valves. And notice they're glowing red. We stained these with an intercalating stain called acridine orange, which turns green in the presence of DNA when it connects the DNA. It's called intercalating because it goes into that double helix inside of it, and it connects inside there. And when it's RNA, it's just one of the helices, right? And so here it's reporting RNA. It's red when it finds RNA. It's green when it finds DNA. So here it is reporting red inside these very old vein valves. So that was astonishing to us, it, how uh, many of the different stains that we use react uh, with these tissues. In fact, we use toluidine blue, which is a very common stain in uh, biology and cell biology. And here now the cuspids, they took up so much stain that they're almost black, right? So this is unheard of for, for ancient tissues and they are ancient. We can call them ancient, even if they're 6,000, 8,000, 10,000 years old. That, to me, that's ancient, ancient, right? I'm only 67, so, right? So these guys are way older than all of us. And look at how much stain, though, that this takes up. So it's really astonishing to see uh, the level of reaction between these tissues and actual science that's used routinely in laboratories all over the world every day. Now, we take some of these bones and we thin section them. And I meant to bring a thin section tonight. They're very fragile, so I don't often travel with them. But here's a thin section that's one half the diameter of one of your hairs. So you're looking down on it, but if you were to pick it up and hold it on end, you'd see that it's very thin, half the diameter of one of your hairs in thinness. The way they do this is they take these bones uh, after we process them, and we do process them. We put them in a fixative and, and sort of stabilize everything. And that's really important because most of the paleontologists making thin sections of bones don't see the things that we're seeing, which is all this dark. 
You see all the dark in here? All this black everywhere? See all that? And it's all associated with these openings. What are these openings? These openings are canals. These those are blood canals. And so there was a blood vessel traveling through there, together with a vein and a nerve, right? That neurovascular bundle. But all this dark stuff, those are all blood clots. So we're looking at some of these Haversian canals. And, and remember the diagram that showed them so nice and beautiful. Maybe I can back up to that real quick. Remember how beautiful this is in the drawing? Nice and round, right? And that's the way they look in living bone. But here in these dinosaur bones, you can see that some of these get pretty uh, thin. The lumen, the opening here, gets really narrow. Uh, and some of these uh, uh, vessel canals are completely occluded. They're completely blocked with blood clots. Uh, and we're, we're the first ones ever to report this, and it was reported in this journal back in September. It's made quite a stir. And so this harkens back to the first paper. This is a figure from the first paper that was published in 2012 in Acta Histochemica, and we showed some of the blood vessels. This is a blood vessel, and you've got these crystallized blood products in there, and that's what these guys look at like when you examine them under a microscope. And here it is again. You can see the, the clot in there. And I don't know if you can make out that little bump right there. Here's a couple over here. See that bump? See that bump? Those are cells. Those are osteocytes. And they're living right on the outside of that blood vessel. So right on the outside of that blood vessel are osteocytes, which are making the bone. Right? And we studied these in very high uh, magnification electron microscopy. And here's one of these little thread feet coming off of this cell. Now this is an interesting picture because normally when you put specimens in the scanning electron microscope, you have to coat them with metal. So regardless of the biological tissue that you're working with, after you finish processing it, you have to coat it in metal. You use a, a vacuum chamber with a high electric current and it sputters out atoms of gold or palladium onto your specimen and coats them. That way when you're, when you're using an electron microscope, which uses a, a beam of electrons, so we're using light for most light microscopes, but an electron microscope doesn't use photons. They're huge compared to an electron. So you can get much higher resolution by using electrons, which are tiny. But you have to close that electrical circuit. Remember when you were a kid and you were stupid like me and you licked your finger and stuck it in a socket? I hope you didn't do that. But what I did is I closed the electrical circuit and the electricity went through my body. Right? And so that's what we do by coating these. Well, this guy is uncoated. This is a special microscope called an environmental microscope, not because it's good for the environment, but it means that you can put specimens in it and it's like they're almost in their normal environment because it's very low vacuum, not high vacuum, and you don't have to coat things. So we have this philopodia, this thread feet, which is only 200 nanometers wide. So take that one one hundredth of one of your hairs, right, your hair is 100 microns, take that one micron, and divide that into a thousand slices. And 200 of those slices, right, is the thickness of this thread foot. 200 nanometers. These guys are really tiny. And the reason this is important is because the paleontologists who are doing most of this work in dinosaur soft tissue contend that the iron from the blood is what preserved the soft tissues. Uh, how many of you have heard of that theory, the iron preservation theory? Okay, you probably don't understand it. Uh, if you do, I congratulate you because there's a lot of organic chemistry in there. But iron, uh, Fe, Fe3 plus, is, is highly reactive and it will gobble up these tissues like Pac-Man. And one of the contentions is, is the, the blood... Uh, from the red blood cells, the hemoglobin from the red blood cells escaped and traveled through the bone and preserved everything in its path. 
Now the problem is there's a downside to that scenario. Iron is so destructive that it will eat half of the tissue before it even begins to supposedly preserve something. And our point was in this paper, here's a, uh, an osteocyte, a bone cell, right on the outside of the blood vessel, and it still has not been chewed up by iron. And so we're showing actual results that, that show that these things were not in the presence of Fenton reactions or iron uh, from the blood. In fact, we went even further uh, and we looked at these blood clots under a fluorescent microscope. Now, when you work with a fluorescent microscope, you're dealing with only one or maybe a couple wavelengths of light. You've all seen the rainbow that goes through a prism and divides into the colors, right? So that's called the visible spectrum. Everything you can see is generally within those colors of the rainbow. If you're a fighter pilot, you might have more visual acuity and you, you can see maybe, you know, 100 gray levels. Most people see about 60 to 80 gray levels and we apportion those into color. But if you're a fighter pilot, you see 110, 120. Well, here we're hitting these blood clots in a fluorescent microscope with blue fluorescence. So the light we're using is only from the blue part of the spectrum. And the tissues, all soft tissues, react to light. There's a process called autofluorescence, where tissues just glow, right? Uh, it's really cool. And so the bone here is glowing under the blue light because there's a lot of proteins in here. All those philopodia are in here. All other, there's a lot of other tissues. There's collagen in here, uh, collagen fibers. And all of those things are glowing. And it's a little hard to see on the screen, but... Uh, normally, uh, you can see this a little bit better. I'll show you another picture in a second. So that's the fluorescent microscope. Under a polarized light microscope, which is this image, and let's just back up here, and I'll show you this image again. This is a polarized light image of a bone section. What does that mean? If you ever buy a pair of Foster Grant's uh, glasses and you pop those lenses out, if you put them in front of each other and turn them, it'll, the light will turn black because it's polarizing the light. So you can't see the light that's coming through with your eye, but the light is coming through. And so that has a neat feature with things like bone because you can see all the collagen fibers. All these are collagen fibers that are glowing in polarized light. Well, they're also reacting to the blue fluorescence here, and they're glowing yellow. Uh, but look at the blood. Here's the clot over here. You can see some of the, uh, some of the straight edges because all this is crystallized, right? These are all crystals uh, of blood in here in the clot. But you can see a little green here. These are the collagen fibers reacting to the polarized light. But in fluorescence, it's a little bit different. Here's another shot. So here it is in polarized light. You can see the red and the green. That's the collagen fibers. You can see the clots in here. Right? See those clots? There's a lot of them. In fact, this is a big canal. Here's another canal. And this is a little canal that has a connection here. And you can really see this right here. So here's the connection between the big canal and this little tiny canal. And look at these individual crystallized blocks of blood that are crystallized. And they, pardon me, they have not moved outside into the bone. They've not spread into the bone. So this begs the question then, if iron did not get into these tissues to preserve them, how are they preserved? Right? So that's a real problem for that theory, the iron preservation theory, because we're not seeing the iron translate into the bone. Now, we also use the fluorescent microscope with UV light. Now this is light that can be very damaging to your eyes. So you have to use this very carefully. But here's a bone in, in white light. This is a triceratops vertebrate, thin slice. And look at these clots. Look how dark these clots are. But you, you change the lighting and you look at them in UV light and look at how they change. Okay? So this big thick clot here is right here. Look at all the particulate in here. This is all crystallized blood, blood products. But notice also the sharp demarcation 
between the iron, which is glowing blue here, that's what iron does under UV light. So we know we're looking at iron because it's glowing the right color. But look at this, this sharp demarcation where the iron did not infiltrate into the bone. And like I say, we found this in, in many different individuals, about six different individuals to date. Here's, a, here's the horn. So I showed you the vertebra, which is this guy. Here's the horn. And you can download the paper, and you'll see also rib and frill pictures. The rib, of course. And then the frill is the big bone that comes off the skull of the triceratops. So we found this in the frill also. And, and here you have clots that have no holes in them. They're completely occluded, completely blocked. And you can see the same thing here. But that iron did not pass this barrier. And so every individual that we've looked at, and so far there's about six of them, has these clots. All right, you might say, so what? What's the big deal about the clots? Well, there's a medical condition called disseminated intravascular coagulation. This is well known to medicine, well known to science, and it's a condition that is typical of a drowning victim who drowned in water. They have clots systemically, not just in their bones, but of course, all that soft tissue from the dinosaurs has gone away, right? But what's left? They're bones, and they're full of clots, highly demarcated, that don't translate out into the bone, they stayed in the canal, showing that these guys drown in water. So I think we've got some good world first discoveries so far, don't you? <laughs> I do. <laughs> Here's another picture. Now, this is, this is camera source. Now, now remember, uh, we're told that, um, and this is horn, I believe. Uh, we're told that this Triceratops horn is 68 to 70 million years old. But Camarasaurus, that's much older, 145 million. And look at here. There's a clot. There's a clot. Here's a Volkmann's canal. This is the little adjoining canals. Uh, if we were to go back to that bone picture, you'd see the vertical canals and then these little like ladder steps. That's called a Volksmann canal. And here you see that the clot only went so far into the Volksmann canal. And then there's this open space here. But when you magnify that, look at all these little circles in here. Kind of look like red blood cells. So 145 million years old evidence of drowning in water. Uh, and it gets better than that. This is a, uh, a fish vertebra. It's a Devonian fish. So this is 400,000 millennia, 400 million years old. And I I'm sorry about the screen. It's not so bright. But can you see these individual blood cells in here? Those are individual blood cells all suspended in calcite. It's all suspended in calcite. This, this came out of coal. So this all this black around here. Here's the vertebra, here's the hole in the center, and it's all encased in coal. And this was thin section, and there's blood cells right there in a 400 million year old specimen. So those are the blood clots, and, and we think that's a pretty important find. Now we've also found nerves, and we reported this in the journal in September. These are nerve fibers, and I don't know if you can make it out here, but you see these little bands, these white bands, they're kind of vertical going against the long axis. And you can actually, if you look carefully, you can actually see them kind of repeated all the way down here. This is a very well-known characteristic of nerve tissue called the bands of Fontana. Uh, this, is, this has been known for many years. This goes back really, <laughs> in fact, it's an amazing story. Um, dinosaur, uh, sorry, uh, nerve tissue has been studied for about 375 years so far. Uh, it even uh, predates Antony van Leeuwenhoek. Now, I don't know if you recognize his name, but if, if you play with microscopes like I do, you recognize that name because uh, he was a Dutch textile merchant uh, living in the Netherlands, and he kept pestering the Royal Society in London because he would make these little handheld microscopes. He would grind his own lenses, and he had a little uh, screw stage on there that he could put a specimen on. He looked at everything. And Tony van Leeuwenhoek looked at everything. And he kept sending his results to the Royal Society in London. Finally, they made him a fellow 
of the Royal Society, even though he did not have a degree in science. Uh, and his publications go back to the 1600s. So people have been looking at nerves since Antoni van Leeuwenhoek. And so the Banza Fontana, I mean, I give a current reference here, but these go way back in the literature. So we reported this in September, and you're going to see more work on this, uh, which has just been submitted to the journal. So here now is a avian nerve. Uh, this was removed from a chicken thigh, and you're looking at a cross section of the nerve, cross section end on, all right? And what I did is I, I put it in uh, a fixative called osmium, and it started to turn the uh, neural tissue inside the nerve black. And you can see some black out here. This is mostly uh, vasculature because these guys need a lot of blood supply. The nerves do. Uh, but, but you can see this covering. It has a very thick outer covering because these nerves have to be insulated. They're carrying electrical signals, right? And so if you didn't have this covering, you'd be shocked by yourself all the time. I shocked myself all the time, but differently. Anyway, that was my attempt at a joke tonight. But here's this outer covering. This is called epineurium. And then there's another layer. If you, if you take this one off, there's another layer inside of it. Uh, let's see, did I have this picture in here? I don't know if I had a picture of the perineurium. I don't think I did. Uh, but you'll be able to see this paper online. If you, if you pull this off, there's a thin, thin layer around uh, the nerve called the perineurium. And the literature, we looked in the literature, and we found this illustration from Gleaze. This is a paper that he published in the Journal of Anatomy in 1943. And he illustrated a nerve, and these are all the nerve fibers. These are actually uh, called fascicles. This is a nerve proper. These are called fascicles. They're wrapped in yet another covering called ep uh, endoneurium. And then the axons are in there. The axons are the cells that actually transmit the electricity. And they do it at like 20 meters per second, 30 meters per second. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Anyway, this is Gleese's uh, illustration. And I can't remember what organism this is. I think this may have been uh, porcine or, or a pig. Uh, but we found this uh, same crosshatch pattern in an avian nerve. So this is a nerve taken from the bone of that chicken that I dissected. And um, you can see the crosshatch pattern. Again, uh, it's not really evident that much on the screen. If you want to come up and look at the laptop later, it's much clearer. But this is, this is a crosshatch pattern that is dual wrapped. So one set of collagen fibers go this way across the nerve, and the other goes this way. And so if you've ever taken a video cable Remember back when our TVs were all on cable? Now it's all through the internet, right? But we had this thick coax cable, right? You ever look inside one of those? You ever peel off that rubber? That would be the outer coating, right, of the nerve, that outer rubber on a coaxial cable. But if you look inside, you'll see a metal crosshatch covering, a protective covering. If you don't believe me, go home and... I mean, don't wreck your television, but find some coax cable. Cut off the rubber, and you will see this pattern in metal. This pattern, you'll see it in metal. One half going this way, and the other half going that way. Well, here it is here in the avian nerve. And so we wanted to confirm that, yes, this does exist in a chicken nerve, in a bone nerve. Remember, these were taken out of the bone. These are very, very tiny nerves. But... Then we went to our material and we looked at the Triceratops condyle. The condyle is a softball-shaped bone at the base of the skull of the Triceratops. So it's what allows it to rotate on that condyle. And so we decalcified this. And look at what we found. That's a perfect indication of the crosshatch pattern in a birefringent nerve from Triceratops condyle. And we found many examples of this. Whoops, I went the wrong way. There we go. Here's another example of it. 
Folks, I can't find a better picture of a dinosaur nerve than this one. Because there's no question about this crosshatch pattern. That is definitely a nerve. It's got that outer perineurium coating. Here's another example, and you can see it's this one started to split apart a little bit. So there's a division here and division here, and you can see it just kind of falling out of there. Some of the ends are so these guys are pretty beaten up, but you can still see the collagen fibers inside of these guys. Not only did we find the individual nerves themselves, but we found wrappings that, that obviously fell away from the nerve. And here they are sitting on the bottom of the decalcification plate. Uh, here it is in bright field. This is polarized light. The reason we do polarized light is because these things glow in polarized light. They're called birefringent. And so they're really easy to spot. Um, but this is the actual wrapping that went around one of those nerves that's now fallen out uh, in solution and is laying on the bottom of the Petri dish. And here's another one. This one's a little bit larger, but you can see the wrapping. See it go around like this? The blue parts are on top, the purple parts are on the inside. So there's abundant evidence that we are finding nerve tissues inside of these bones. And like I say, six different individuals so far. And we're just getting started. The other thing that you find are the fascicles. Now, what are the fascicles? Let's go back to Gleese's illustration here. And you'll see inside of this nerve are the individual fascicles. What is a fascicle? A fascicle is a grouping of axons, and it could be anywhere from 5 to 10 up to 40 to 50, depending on the need of the nerve in the organism. Typically in bone, the nerves are very small, so you don't find really large fascicles. But these fascicles have the axons in them, and they're also, uh, the, the bands of Fontana that I show you are very evident in these guys. Let me give you an example. So this is a comparison of a chicken compact bone fascicle, and you can see these lines in here. Remember I showed you the lines in the original nerve that we published already? Well, these are those bands of Fontana in a chicken compact bone nerve, and here it is in a condyle and a vertebra. I have dozens and dozens and dozens of pictures of fascicles that we took out of dinosaur bones. Um, so. Every single bone that we've examined has fascicles. Now, what would really be interesting is there is an experiment that's done in neuroscience, neurobiology, whereby they put an action potential across the nerve. What does that mean? They actually, they actually start an electrical signal, and you can watch it travel down a nerve in a living system or a nerve just dissected out of an organism. How cool would it be to do an action potential across a dinosaur nerve, right, and to measure the speed at which things travel down that nerve. So I'm not saying it can be done, but I think I'd love to try it if we could find out how to do it. Now, the last thing that I want to show you here about the nerves is that I thin section this. So I took the nerve that I collected out of the bone, and these things are really small. I'm going to show you a video in a second about how small these are. And I fixed it, and I uh, dehydrated it. You had to take all the water out of it. And then I soaked it in a liquid polymer, a liquid plastic. Uh, and once it infiltrated into the nerve, I put it in an oven and cured it. And then you can thin section it, because it's been plasticized. And so I've made these sections about six microns thin. Remember, human hair is how many? A hundred. So six micron thick sections of this nerve. And I was able to do a serial section. So I start at the top of the nerve and I work my way through. And I'm able to get about five or six sections out of the nerve. So here's the nerve, the one that you saw earlier. I put this in plastic, I thin sectioned it, and now you're seeing uh, mostly the, excuse me, the outer surface of the nerve, that covering. Remember that cross hatched covering. It covers fascicles and it covers nerves, okay? And one of the things that's evident here are these junction lines, right? They're going 
against each other at a 90 degree angle, right? Uh, I guess it's 45. Anyway, these uh, are the uh, uh, sections in between those wrappings that extend almost all the way through uh, the covering itself. So this is the insulation, that's the covering on the outside, and you can see those indentations from these grooves. Now some of this is probably a result of concretion and desiccation and separation over time. There's a term used in forensics called uh, grave wax. Have you heard that term before? Anybody heard that? Grave wax? It's just all the fats, the lipids in your body, as your body decomposes, they kind of congeal together. And so these nerves, they're somewhat concreted as a result of the grave wax formation over time. But what I want you to see is there's a beautiful uh, uh, margin here, an interface between the covering here that's white, you can see the grooves in it, and here's a fascicle with the bands of Fontana in it. And now I've cut through it here, so I've already cut through the fascicle, which must be smaller than six microns because it went away, and here it's gone. But look at this one, can you see that little line there? That's a band of Fontana all by itself. I know it's kind of low on screen, but uh, so this was just submitted to the same journal. The editor has it, and he's evaluating it now. So I'm the first one in the world to ever do serial sections of dinosaur bones. Well, we're the first ones to show nerves in the first place. So we're, we're making a lot of world for us, which is really exciting. So I've got a couple of videos I'd like to show, and let's see how good I am technically. The first one I'm going to show you is the original stretchy tissue um, when I first found the horn, uh, it was all cracked uh, and degraded. It wasn't one solid bone. It broke into many pieces when we rolled it over. And so I was able to take that back to my lab and pressure fracture it with my hands. So I broke open a piece of that horn, like I have here on the table, and against the horn core, which is the very center of the horn, was this reddish brown material. Well, I peeled it off the bone. You could see it with the naked eye. And I put it in a Petri dish. I did not process this at all. It was already there on the bone. I just peeled it away. And I want to show you how stretchy this is. So I took uh, fine needle forceps. And these are, these are so sharp that if you bump it into your finger, you'll puncture your finger with them. They're that sharp of a fine needle forcep. And so I grabbed it with two forceps, and this is what happened. It's like a piece of taffy. Remember, I didn't process this at all. I cracked open the horn, I found this against the horn core, I peeled it away, I put it in some phosphate buffered saline, which is a little happy liquid for it to be in, and I stretched it like this. And this video has gone viral. It's, it's gone around the world, which is really kind of cool. So that's the first video that I made when I found this. Now, I want to also show you this one, because I went back to that same portion of bone that still had some of that uh, reddish brown material on it, and I just soaked the whole bone, the piece of bone, and the soft material on it in phosphate buffered saline. And then I took those fine needle forceps, and remember, I didn't process this. No chemicals were used. And now I'm pushing these fine needle forceps in underneath. And this is attached to the bone. This is the way it came out of the ground. A lot of the critiques online of my work have claimed falsely that I had to process this in order to get it soft or to get it to do this. That's not the case. Now I thin sectioned this, remember the osteocytes we talked about, and I thin sectioned this. So I took that soft stretchy material and I put it on a frozen section machine and I cut sections out of it and one of those pictures made the cover of American Laboratory. And this should, there it is right there. So that's the cover of American Laboratory which showed my thin section of that reddish brown material with all these osteocytes in here. Again, it's not that clear on the screen. If you want to come up and see it on my laptop later, you can. But these are osteocytes with all those little filipodia reaching out and touching each other. 
And so this cover, and it, it described uh, what the cover picture was. I, I went uh, to great lengths to, to state that this was soft and cut on a frozen section machine. You may have heard of the term cryostat. These are used in hospitals. If, if, uh, if, a patholo or if a surgeon removes a tumor from a patient on the table, they send it to pathology, and pathology cuts it on a frozen section machine. They make slides out of it, and they look at them under the microscope, and they call the OR, and they say, yeah, you got everything, or no, you missed a margin over here, and then they'll go back in and do a little more cutting. So that's what a cryostat is. And we used it, I used it, the thin section, that soft reddish material that you saw me peeling off the bone. Um, all right, I got a couple more. This one, all right, I'm going to save that one for last. <laughs> okay, you remember I talked to you about um, vein valves, remember? And I showed you those pictures of those two little vein valves glowing red. Well, here's a vein valve that I stained with the acridine orange. And as this movie goes on, you can, you'll see this uh, orange color, which is what class? That's RNA, right? It's not green, kind of reddish orange, so that's RNA. And you'll see that color fade over time because the stain is being used up by the fluorescence. And so the other thing I want you to notice is that this is a complete vein valve with the, uh, uh, with the cuspids closed. And it's holding an amount of liquid. And inside that liquid are several bacteria that have also been stained by the RNA stain, and they're glowing orange also. So I hope you can see this. Uh, these videos are all up online too. Can you see that moving around in there? So those are the bacteria. If I grab this little guy and move it back and forth, can you see that? And if you go back to the beginning and see how bright it is, you get down here, it's not as bright because that stain is fading over time, which is what normal tissues do. Okay? When I used to train PhDs in my laboratory at California State University, Northridge, I had to train them to work quickly because the stains that they were working with, the fluorescent stains, would uh, be used up really quickly and they'd get terrible results. And I had to, come on guys, you gotta work faster because that, that glow is gonna go away. But here it is, these, these bacteria are swimming around in there, which means they cannot get out. They cannot get out of this intact valve. That's proof positive that this is an intact valve from a dinosaur vein, uh, <laughs> a dinosaur vein. No, I don't want to do that. Cancel. Um, okay, I got one more here to show you. Actually, two. Um, I'm going to show you this one first, save the best for last. This is now a picture that I received this morning. Um, after I wrote the new paper, I sent it to the rest of the district personnel. And my colleague, Jim Soliday, who's a co-author on this paper that was published in September, uh, went back to some of his slides of an organism that we've been studying called K-Cops. Now, this is an amphibian, and I, I brought some of the limb bones here. Uh, these are very precious to me, but if you want to come up and look at these later. And uh, I actually pulled a fascicle out of one of these limb bones. And these are 300 million years old, we're told. So he went back into his specimens and he shot this picture and you can see the crosshatch here. That's a nerve fascicle from a 300 million year old K-Cops amphibian. So I don't know. I think it's kind of cool. <laughs> okay, one last video to show and then we'll take a short break. This now is a nerve, a bone nerve. And remember, these are uh, 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 ne fine needle forceps. So, so the needles that you see coming in are as sharper than a, a regular pin. Maybe, maybe a sewing needle would be more like the sharpness of these. And what I did is I grabbed this nerve by the ends and I tugged on it. Well, that's a triceratops nerve being stretched by fine needle forceps. Okay, that's all the wonderful show and tell I have.